Hey everyone, Current TCG here. My name's Dave Klein and I'll be your tour guide for the next oh, couple of minutes or so. And by the end of this episode, I hope to have you all literally depolarizing right out of your seat. Now today I want to talk to you guys about oxygen. Yeah, that's right, oxygen. We know that the body and the cells of your body need sugar water oxygen to survive. And as emergency practitioners, well, we have oxygen available to us as a potential treatment for our patients. But we need to be careful with oxygen and the amount of oxygen we give our patients. Because did you know that oxygen is poison to your body if it's not being utilized for cellular respiration? Yeah, and we're going to get into a bit more information about that in a second. But let's just recap this whole process of breathing in oxygen and how we measure it. So we take a nice big deep breath. That oxygen travels down our lungs, it gets to our alveoli, it crosses the respiratory membrane, it gets into the blood, and when it's there, we hope that it binds with a red blood cell. And then we can measure the amount of red blood cells that are bound with oxygen. Well, actually, the oxygen binds with the iron component of hemoglobin on a red blood cell. But anyway, the red blood cells, well, we can measure the amount of red blood cells that are bound with oxygen using our tool called an oxygen saturation probe. Actually, I know a lot of you are thinking, well, that's not totally true. Well, you're right. What the oxygen saturation probe does is it measures the amount of red blood cells that are bound with something. It's giving you the percentage of red blood cells that are bound with something. And what I mean by that is it could be carbon monoxide, it could be methemoglobin, but we hope it's an oxygen molecule so that we can rely on our oxygen saturation probe. So the thing to remember, though, is that that oxygen saturation probe, yeah, well, once you get to 100% saturated, it can't tell us, it can't measure the amount of oxygen that's freely floating in your blood. We don't know that. And we need to know that because that's an important thing because that kind of oxygen can be a real problem to our body and the cells of our body. And so basically when your O2 sat probe gets to 100% saturation, well, the amount of oxygen in your blood measured in millimeters of mercury, it could go from 100, it could go beyond. It can get to 200, 300, 400, 500 and up. And that depends on how much oxygen you're applying to your patient. But the O2 sat probe can't tell you that. It can't measure that amount of oxygen that's just freely floating in your blood. It's off the charts. And when it's off the charts, what happens is, is that oxygen's not being utilized for its regular purpose in cellular respiration. And so what does that oxygen molecule do? Well, it changes its purpose. It basically oxidizes or changes its mission. And instead of trying to help your body with sugar water oxygen to survive, it starts to harm your body. And we don't want to be the practitioners that are causing that type of harm to our patients. And so that oxygen-free radical, as we call it, I'm sure you, many of you have heard that term, be careful about oxygen-free radicals. Well, yeah, so this is true. But a lot of us don't really understand, well, how do oxygen-free radicals really work? Well, in order to understand that concept, I'm going to tell you a little story, I'll give an analogy between the two on what's really happening with this auction free radical. So I want to picture you guys, your vacation time has finally been approved. You've saved up a bunch of cash from working so much overtime. You've booked your dream safari. You've arrived there. You've got a guide. You're out in the Serengeti. You're laying in the tall grass and you see a pride of lions and those pride of lions are hungry. And they're looking for some dinner. And what are they looking at? Yeah, they're looking across that way at the large amount of antelopes over there. And so they're trying to decide which antelopes are we going to target? Who do you think they're going to go after? Yeah, that's right. They're going to go after the weak and the sick ones or the young ones. But mostly the weak and the sick ones because they're easier targets for them. That's the same concept we need to think about when we're talking about oxygen-free radicals. So when an oxygen-free radical is looking for a purpose. What it's doing is it's trying to stabilize itself. It's like it's hungry. It doesn't want to be hungry anymore, just like those lions. It's trying to stabilize itself. And how does it do it? It stabilizes itself by binding with an electron. Now, I'm not going to get into a giant discussion on protons, neutrons, and electrons. Basically, you just need to know that they exist. And this oxidized or oxygen-free radical, it's searching for an electron to try and stabilize itself. And so that it becomes less sort of radicalized. Now, how does it do it? Well, it starts to look at the walls of cells. So this oxygen or oxidized or oxygen-free radical, it starts going along and it's looking for cells that it can easily steal an electron from the cell wall. So picture a cell like you see here. This is a picture of a wall. Picture this is the cell wall and it's made up of a ton of bricks. And those bricks are all little electrons. And so the oxidized or oxygen-free radical comes along and it starts pulling out an electron or like pulling a brick out of the wall. 
And so more oxygen free radicals come, come along, they pull on those bricks, they pull them out of the wall and more and more and more. And eventually what happens to that wall? Well, that wall is going to crumble. It's going to fall down. And that's what's happening in the cell. The cell wall starts to break down and the contents of the cell start to just spill out. And so that cell starts to die. It starts to become ineffective. Those electrons are being pulled out of the cellular wall and that cell starts to break down because the oxygen free radicals are stealing the electron and basically running away with them. And so who do you think those oxygen free radicals are going to target? Which cells are the ones they want to go after and steal those electrons from? Remember our analogy to the lions? Yeah, the lions went after the sickest and the weakest. So now you have a patient who's suffering from a myocardial infarction. We come along, we give them a normal breather at 15 liters a minute. We get their oxygen saturation up to 100%. But now you're giving them so much oxygen that you could be way beyond 100, 200, 300, 400 millimeters of mercury of oxygen floating in their blood. So what's happening? Which of those oxygen-free radicals going to target? Where are they going to go? Yeah, that's right. They're going to target the weakest cells. And what are the weakest cells when a patient's suffering from a myocardial infarction? Yeah, the cells that are infarcting in the heart. And so what's happening, ladies and gentlemen, is we are causing harm to our patients potentially by exacerbating the size of the infarct because the amount of oxygen we're giving our patients is causing those oxygen-free radicals to go after the cells in your heart that are already infarcting from an acute coronary occlusion. And they're making those cells break down and those cell walls die quicker. And we don't ever want to cause that type of harm to our patients. And so that is why it's, we need to be mindful of how we give oxygen. And ideally, when you're, get, you're treating a patient with acute coronary syndrome, you want to keep their oxygen saturation between 94 and 99%. That way, you always know how much oxygen is in that patient's body. And it doesn't ever go beyond that 100% where you have tons of oxygen just freely floating in the blood. So keeping the patient's oxygen saturation between 94 and 99% will avoid this whole problem with oxygen-free radical damage. And so always remember that when we're giving our patients with acute coronary syndrome oxygen. Be mindful. Keep the SAS between 94 and 99%, and you may never have a problem. And until next time, sugar water oxygen to survive, the eyes can't see what the mind doesn't know, and in Klein's world, who gets an ECG? Almost everybody. Stay current. Hey, everyone. Thanks for being a part of today's episode. If you'd like to continue your learning, improve your skills, and provide a higher level of patient care, well, come be part of our community. If you're a student who wants to break through in emergency medicine, learn how to work the trucks in the streets, well, this is for you. If you're a seasoned veteran who's like, hey, I need to brush up on my skills. Technology's moving forward, so should we. Then this is for you. Come join this community at CurrentECG.com. Let's make emergency medicine education and ECG interpretation a little less scary and a little more fun. Again, subscribe to us at CurrentECG.com. Hope to see you soon. Stay current.